live on Facebook. I am so excited to have another Wellness Wednesday experience. We are so grateful and so thankful to be able to come to you again with Wellness Wednesday. Listen, if no one else needs Wellness Wednesday, I need it. I need it. So I'm Beth Copeland with Georgia Christian Business Network, and we are putting God back in business. I have such a great opportunity to come to you each week on this platform with some amazing people, women of God that are professionals, that are experienced counselors, therapists. And so today is no differently. I get to be on the platform with the fantastic four minus one. Okay. Christine is not with us today, but what I'd like to do at this point is allow our wonderful leader who we just, we just love how God uses her mightily on this platform to lead us into these great discussions. And, you know, it's not easy being Pamela Bridgman Bartell, but she does it with ease. And I want to say thank you publicly, Pamela. I, I love the girls, Christine, Jessica, and even myself. We contribute, but because of you leading and hearing from God, the topics that we're discuss week after week. And we privately, Christine, Jessica, and I give you kudos because you have to be in tune with God. And you know, when someone is that close and hears from God, there's going to be opportunities where the enemy is not going to be pleased. And so God just placed her on my heart this morning. This is Wednesday, my day of fasting. And she was one of my targets today. So many others, but Pamela, you were one of my targets today and you look beautiful and thank you. I know you're going to get me for taking up probably what you think is too much time about you, but no, it's in order. So thank you. And now you take it from here. God bless you. Thank you. This month we are talking about um, the um, arm of God. Uh, I am Pamela Bridgman Bartell. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I also hold credentials as a certified master addictions counselor and a certified uh, clinical trauma professional. I'm an ordained minister and a United States Air Force uh, veteran. Uh, I, I always like to point out that I'm a veteran. I am proud to have served our country. Uh, I have a practice here in Northwest Georgia, part of school, uh, specifically called the Healing Journey Counseling and Consultation. Uh, and I provide trauma-informed care uh, for individuals ages five to geriatric, mental health, substance use disorder, and relationship counseling. Uh, and I have been providing compassion care since 1976. Jessica? I'm Jessica Banner. I have a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling, uh, which emphasizes uh, professional counseling along with disability counseling. Um, Worked about 10 years in the psychiatric mental health field in a hospital, uh, doing substance abuse and psychiatric work with adults and adolescents, and ran the adolescent program for about six years, and um, over oversighted all of our programs in our department to some degree, uh, till I transitioned uh, the last six years, uh, doing private practice in a church, helping get private practice off the ground, doing trauma recovery work, currently working on writing a book, <laughs> always staying accountable to that, um, also helping develop some training programs and working on some of my own curriculum development. Jessica, you kick us off just by... I want to read this particular scripture every week this month that we do this. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to be reading out of Ephesians 6, uh, starting with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt with the truth, uh, 
girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all uh, perseverance and supplication for all. I uh, mentioned last week, um, we're not doing these like in the order that they come in the passage. Not sure why Holy Spirit had me do it this way. So today we're looking at the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, even though they're not listed that way in the particular scripture. Also last week, uh, we uh, talked about uh, why we read all the way down to prayer uh, as also a, a, a weapon of, of warfare. Jessica, do you, even if you don't recall what we said uh, uh, last week, make a comment on why it is that prayer is also powerful weapon um i i think last week we talked even a little bit about how praise and worship and prayer are two of our very offensive weapons in the kingdom um because prayer prayer does a lot of things it's the place where we intimately get to converse with the lord but it, it's almost like being in the war room with the lord <laughs> right like we get to strategy have, uh, Exactly. It's our, it's a strategy meeting, but it's also a place to go to our commanding officer and receive all the things that we need uh, for the battle on, on top of that. And, and to um, just petition him on our behalf, you know, and share with him our real heart about things. And, and I think in scripture, you know, we always see that prayer and worship went before everything in the kingdom. So everything is built on a foundation of prayer and worship. Uh, so I think that speaks strongly because it positions, to me, it positions the position of the Lord in all things yes. when we pray. Yeah. Did you want to come on, on that, Beth? Why prayer is also, uh, you, you're muted, but why prayer is also a weapon. It's listed in this passage. You know, when I think of that, and I think of the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God. To connect with God is through prayer. And when you think of the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Um, if I'm not connected to God, I have no weapons. Right. Really? Do I? I mean, answer right. that for me. Do do yeah, I really? like I like even what's listed here? How can I put them on if I'm not receiving them from God? And how can I receive them from God except through prayer? Except through prayer. And so when you were saying that, and I was posting, I was like, I got to get back because I want to say something. <laughs> I said, but I'm not going to say anything unless because I'm late getting over there. But yes, because. Honestly, think about it in my personal life. And, you know, you guys know where I am right now. And, oh, my God, I'm like, Pamela said it so soothingly. And I don't think she realizes it, but it was soothing to me. It is still the year of higher ground. When Jessica prays, y'all, y'all have to be here because it sets the tone for where we're having to go and build upon but uh, Pamela was saying, it is a year of higher ground. And I feel like I'm under attack because God, I'm, I didn't create it. God gave it to me to share with others that this is the year of higher ground. And at every angle that I face is trying to attack me because of my telling others and lifting them up to say, hey, the season is here. This is a year of high ground. So what would you do? You try to denounce that through me, you know, because and the attacks come. But when I connect with God and, and it's like we're talking about fully armored, you know, and I have to have on my full armor. So I was like, but the connector is prayer. 
The connector the prayer. is prayer. Yeah, and I and I've always wondered, uh, you know, when I hear people teach this passage, I've always wondered why they don't include a lot of people don't include prayer. You know, they just stop. Uh, you know, uh, at fiery darts, right? They stop at verse 16 or, or verse uh, verse 17 and don't include verse 18. And to me, verse 18 just seems to be a natural extension of that entire passage. Okay, so um, each week this month, I, uh, I want us to remind ourselves uh, and you, our listeners, that the first thing we must do is uh, take a stand before we go into warfare. Apostle Paul emphasizes it. He says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. So taking a stand. So my, my question to the panel here is, how do we as Christ followers take a stand in the marketplace? How do we take a stand uh, in, in our businesses? Jessica, Beth? Go ahead. Um, I have a few thoughts, I, I think, for myself. Um, I'm really big on, well, I, I would say this. First, I think it happens in our heart. I, th I think the very first place we take a stand is in, in the submission of our heart to the partnership with the Lord, that we're actually going to receive these weapons of warfare and be in partnership with him in this natural world. So I, I, I think the first part of taking a stand and being very intentional is, is the process of that relationship and that intimacy and that submission, because from that in every part of our lives, but especially um, in our businesses, it creates that intentionality. When we're intentional with him, we become intentional about every part of our life that we steward. Um, so that, that would be the first and foremost thing. And I think um, the, the first couple of things that came to me from a practical place is I, I am big on anointing my space. I like to definitely Sweet. consecrate a space to the Lord, especially if it's a space he's given me territory. Um, and so I've just learned in my life and in my practice that if I'm going into a new thing and sometimes even if it's not new, you know, for some of you who maybe been in a thing or you've owned your space that there can be a time for a fresh anointing and a fresh, uh, reemergence in that, um, you know, taking a stand. Cause sometimes we get battle weary. Um, and there's, there is something in, and just the practice of reoffering something to the Lord and repartnering with him. Uh, and my other big things were, were prayer. Uh, we just talked a lot about prayer, but, um, that, that is part of that being partnered with the Lord that, it has to start here, especially as a leader, that I'm going to take a stand in my integrity and my character and the way I'm walking out um, and treating people and loving people. Beth, what does it mean to, or not what does it mean, but how do we take a stand in our businesses? I just love what Jessica said, and I'll piggyback on that. The fruit of the spirit at work. You're familiar with my writings there. Um, but overtly and covertly. And I'm hoping someone will hear this and receive freedom because that's what happened for me at a time when I was actively in the workplace and it wasn't all the remote work, but you had to show up at the nine to five. And it was so challenging uh, being a Christian. It was like um, living a dual life, a double life. Uh, but I learned that I could represent him well if I, if I, Beth Copeland, would remember and embrace that overtly, I do have a reporting structure, but covertly, I'm reporting to him always and forever. And remembering that his truth, his word is, is written in such a way that for whatever aspect of our lives, we're able to walk that out. Like it was said to give honor to those that have rule over us. 
whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, the Lord and not yeah. to men. And so those are ways that we take stands, no matter what we're facing in the workplace, what is coming against us, we are still who we are as who God called us to be. And if we operate from that standpoint, that's an opportunity to take a stance. Yeah, and to take a stand is to set boundaries, is to uh, uh, identify what it is your values and your, your, your beliefs are, right? And in your business as a, 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 a ice follower, when you put together your vision, when you put together your mission statement, your mission statement doesn't have to be and all of that, but it's going to reflect that worldview. So even in, in your, your mission statement, in your vision statement, you're, you're taking a stand. And then that having done all to stand, then you're going to walk it out where Paul says, stand therefore. And I see that stand therefore is walking out what you have. I, and I like so, I love it the way you put intentionality, Jessica, where you have been intentional about uh, defining that boundary, right? But you've been intentional about saying, you know, uh, this is what my strategy for my business looking like a God business. I then uh, I, I walk I walk that. I think you're so right on with uh, intention. Have to be intentional. Well, and I think the word says that, you know, when, when Paul writes here, put on the armor of God, that is an action statement, right? And so when we think about intentionality, intentionality isn't, an, is an action. It's yeah. that I'm going forth with action, um, you know, that, that we have to take an action to put those things on. Those things are available to us, but we do have to step into that partnership. We have to be intentional in the putting on of that armor, Right. So I think Paul, Paul calls us to the intentionality of that partnership. Put it on. Put it on. Because Pamela, question, if we're not intentional about it, what does that open us up for? Well, if we are, if we're not intentional, right, it, it, it opens us up to be influenced by other people, to be influenced by well, uh, we're not fighting against uh, flesh and blood, but it opens us up to be influenced by that which is other than the word of God, doesn't it? Awesome. Yeah, I agree. And 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 in the way that you said that is what I was thinking when I was asking that. It, if you're not decidedly disciplined from last year, yes, <laughs> the year of the devil, you will fall for anything. You know, you will. You have to be decidedly disciplined that I am a child of God. I'm a Christian and I'm going to represent him in every aspect of my life. It doesn't Absolutely. shut down because I'm in the marketplace. Right. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So, guys, last week we talked about uh, the weapons of our warfare, not Uh And as we we're talking this week, we understand absolutely why we cannot walk in our own flesh. We cannot because we're wrestling against flesh and blood. So, I would like uh, for all of us, the two of us, and if anything about anyone out there on Facebook to discuss some of the reasons it is difficult to remember that the weapons of our, uh, or, or rather to remember uh, that we're not uh, wrestling against people. Uh, what is it in people's attitudes or their behaviors that reminds us that we are wrestling against something in the spiritual realm as opposed to the natural realm. So let me repeat my question because I stumbled over a little bit. Discuss some of the reasons it's difficult to remember that we cannot be carnal. What is it in behaviors and attitudes that can remind us 
that it is the spiritual realm that we are wrestling with. What behaviors and attitudes do we work with or work to? I would say, I, I, I don't know if this is what you're after, but I want to say one of the things that reminds me that this is a spiritual bear, battle is because when the natural opposition is so strong and it a, the opposition, when I'm opposed so greatly for doing good and in spite of all the things that you think would pan out, because and be received, they're opposed by people. Uh, there's resistance that you feel. Uh, there's fallout. And if we take it as um, in the natural, why are they doing this? Or why did he do this? Or why did she do this? Or it's, it's a mockery trying to be made of who God is in your life. Right. And a prayer call on Monday, um, you just have to come join us sometime. It is just so, so powerful. And uh, one of the things that I have um, experienced in, and I know of, even aside from the prayer call, but two calls that I had back to back last Friday, there's a spiritual attack on marriages. Why is that always an attack on Christian marriages? Why is there always an attack on uh, Christian leaders that preach the gospel? You know, because the enemy knows that we're to live a life. He said, let not many of you become leaders or teachers uh, or rulers, because you're going to be held to a stricter judgment. And the reason Paul encouraged us in that regard is because that is going to be the greatest attack. Is when you're leading the platform. That's kind of what I was talking about with you, Pamela. Yeah, we're getting some of it, but you're the one that <laughs> bringing up these messages and such. And and then I'm getting it some because, you know, I'm the one that created the platform. And then Jessica's getting it. Be, and Christina is because they're saying, I'm here for that. I'm here for you. I want to help others. And, and Jessica I relay back to that over and over again, what you prayed for us about three weeks ago. It's when you're in a position of setting people free, the enemy is after you. He hates you because what you're doing is you're freeing them to experience more of God in their lives. And, and that breakthrough right there, the, the greater the calling, the greater the opposition is going to be. Now I said that, and anybody, I'm not debating. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's what I know. Yeah. I think one of the reasons, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, when I walk into a situation, one of the ways that I know that I'm truly in the midst of a spiritual battle is when people become irrational in their opposition. It's like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. So just just ir 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 irrational uh, opposition, and I'm like, okay, okay, I I can see what this is. I I agree. I think some of the things that help me recognize it are um, when sudden suddenly something feels chaotic where it was ordered. Um, so if I'm feeling a sense of confusion or chaos about the circumstance, it really helps me cue in like I'm so dealing I with would... something, something bigger <laughs> here. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the thing that I was thinking about when you were reading this question, too, was that it it's often per becomes personal, like the things that it feels very personal. We're in a work environment. We have relationships and, and obviously we have varied levels. We talked about this uh, in the last few weeks about the level of exposure in a work environment and how that's shifting some and things like that. But it's like the things that are being directed are hitting things that those people may not even know about. Like those are things that you're dealing with the Lord or you're wrestling in your own spirituality or in your family or, and it's almost like the things that 
that come up when they're speaking or that kind of thing start feeling very personal, like they're hitting hitting those things, which also segues to why it's sometimes difficult is sometimes those things are hitting unresolved trauma in our own lives. Um, it can be an indicator that uh, whatever they're saying, because I will tell you, there's nothing new under the sun. The enemy doesn't try new things to get you. He okay. has worked very hard to trip you up in the way that's going to be best to trip you up. He knows your call. He knows your space. And so he's created a narrative. And so anytime spiritual attack comes, it's going to hit the same narrative most of the time. And so just being aware of where those weak spots or those struggle spots have been. If what those people are saying or doing is hitting that, there's usually an element of a spiritual component to what's been going on. It's an indicator that that's there. Um, and I think it's just difficult because there's just our humanity. You know, I think when we know what love is, we desire that in relationship right? We desire that in relationship with others. And when we're coming up against spiritual warfare, uh, through the actions of others and words of others that often doesn't feel loving. And so it does hit that spot in our humanity that is, is weak and tender and can be hurt. <laughs> and so, um, I think that makes that difficult because we are still human and we, we desire that connection. I tell people all the time, like God wired us for love. So rejection is almost the antithesis of love, right? <laughs> yeah. So when people's behaviors and words feel like rejection versus that love and acceptance, it does hit our humanity, which, which is an indicator that it, our, you know, we talked last week about that vengeance, that revenge yeah. <laughs> piece that falls in the carnal. And when we're hurt, that that is not an uncommon human response. <laughs> so we're actually going to move into the two pieces of armor we wanted to talk about today. Was there anything on Facebook that you saw? Or just Jessica's follow uh, track, and I, I saw um, something here. Let's see. From April. Yes, Miss April says, definitely agree. Confusion is not of God. So when I feel unsettled and a disturbances, a disturbance in my peace, I know I'm off somewhere and seek clarity through prayer and time in the word, quiet time just prayer. to be still and settle my mind. Prayer. Yeah. See, prayer is a weapon, April. Thank you. So studies have shown that wearing a helmet reduces your risk of serious brain injury and death because during a fall or collision, most of the impact energy is absorbed by the helmet rather than your head and brain. But just as important as wearing a helmet is wearing the right helmet. That was good. For a Christian business owner, the correct helmet is the helmet of salvation. According to both Strong's and Thayer's uh, Greek lexicon, the passage that Paul uh, that passage here in referring to the helmet, uh, it reads the hope that comes with salvation. So we're wearing the helmet, which is the hope that comes with salvation. The question to uh, the panel and to anyone on uh, Facebook is, we know that ultimately our hope is to be with Christ in heaven. But we also have hope in this life. How does protecting our minds with the hope of salvation benefit our business? How does protecting our mind with the hope of salvation benefit our business? I really love the lexicon that the hope comes from salvation. Because as you were reading that, what really struck me was Where's the number one place the enemy attacks us? He may come against our physical body in some capacity, but the reality is he comes against our mind. And so when you were reading that about the protection of our brain, you know, we think about that with a physical helmet, like with motorcycles and bikes, because we actually want to protect your physical brain from being harmed. But when we think about a helmet of salvation, that, that figurative, you know, we um, intangible perspective of a helmet it is to protect that emotion and our mental capacity. And that, you know, when we think about how the enemy comes against our mind, it's often to speak 
death to a thing that or or criticism or judgment and so when we think about hope of salvation the beauty of that gift is that my hope comes from something that's beyond me and so when the enemy comes he usually comes in condemnation of me and so when that hope is in something beyond me <laughs> how important it is to put on that hope of, that helmet of salvation because it says whatever you bring against this thing that's against me i'm protected by this thing that is beyond me Any observation at all? Yeah. I I just love um, the hope of glory is just always um, just a great opportunity for me to understand and I and I'm I'm trying to Christ in me is the hope of glory. I was trying to get the scripture together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Colossians one twenty seven. Let me just turn to it because it's not playing out good for me in my memory banks this morning okay um but colossians 1 27 this is what i believe is where i'm trying to go am i going to colossians 1 oh, okay my poet just are bolted yeah to them that will to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the gentiles which is christ in you the hope of glory and i was trying to get it together because I've translated that to hope is my transportation to glory. Uh -huh. and, and so I was trying to, I said, that's not what it says. That's what I write. And that's the way I speak it. And so I was drop, trying to, I knew the scripture was Galatians one twenty seven, but I couldn't get it together. But really I'll say it again. Hope is our transportation to glory. And the attack, as she said, was, it's, it's what? On our minds. It's on our minds. It's the way we think. And like, I was listening to what you read, what April had said. I didn't see that when I was out there. So I'm glad you saw that. <laughs> because the attack, what I did see her say is greater is he that is within me than he does in the world. And that was so soothing to me because my mind, you know how I, how, um, Romans 12 talks about uh, that we have to take control, that our mind has mind. to be transformed formed, and, and renewed. And it's a constant battle sometimes, especially when you're going through warfare. If you're going through warfare, the enemy is going to oppose you first, like Jessica was talking about, hearing your mind. Your mind, if I can get you off track in the way of your thinking, and I first heard Joyce Meyer talk about stinking thinking, and I think she titled a book, I think I have a copy of it here somewhere, uh, that stinking thinking. And the way we started off, Pamela, is prayer. You asked that question, oh my God, it is essential to be able to work this life. Listen, some people, if they were going through some of the challenges that I'm faced with right now, because people see the outside, they don't see what's going on inside. People show you what they want you to see on social media. What And, and maybe that's a good thing because for them or whatever, but where it messes up some people is if you're looking at other people to measure yourself by, you're not measuring apples to apples or oranges to oranges. You've got a grapefruit over here and a peanut over here. And you're not seeing the whole picture. That's why you have to be careful to make sure that you protect your mind, yes. your eye gate, your ear gate, your mouth gate. This morning I prayed, God, there's some things said that I can't hear, God. So you be my ears where I'm not here. And he will convey things to you. Be my eyes when I'm looking at something dead straight on and I can't see it. But you see beneath what the eyes are trying to reveal. And then he gives me discernment. And, and by that mouth to speak when I don't know what to say. I, 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 that allows me to also make a, a comment back to uh, making sure you have on the correct helmet. I think 
part of the correct helmet yeah. for us uh, is um, plays out through the gifts that God has given us. Uh, there are some things that protect my mind uh, as a, a, a five-fold ministry teacher. Uh, and then there's some uh, things that protect the five-fold ministry evangelist. There are some things that protect the, the person who has the gift of hospitality better than it, you know. So I think when uh, Thayer and, and Storms, uh, or rather, this was another piece of uh, research, but I think when the researcher says you have to put on the correct helmet, I think you and I, as Christ followers, have to know what is the correct helmet for us as well. Like uh -huh. Beth always talks about, uh, uh, she and, and I know this to be true of her, she has a strong uh, gift of discerning of spirit, right? And so there is, there is a, 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 a helmet that uh, allows uh, the discerning of spirit to go through that. And so you really need to know where you're strongest. And that would be uh, uh, the capacity of the helmet that you have. And, uh, and I think sometimes, Pamela, the the closer you are to God, allows Him to reveal yourself, Himself to you more. Because I was telling someone yesterday or the day before, or is there was a period of time I was so, so strong in that gifting. And then it was a period of time that a space in time that I was missing him and I was getting caught up, you know, like, how did I miss that God? You know, how did I miss that? Really? You know, and I noticed that he was beckoning me more to become more and more intimate with with him and the closer you know i had to take back that territory so that i could start to hear again and i hear it and it's so keen now and so i want to encourage people that god wants to reveal secrets to us you got to get close um i want to make sure we get to uh the breastplate but i do want to do this uh, this last piece on the helmet. Another aspect of the helmet in this passage is that uh, beyond protection, the Roman helmet served as a symbol of unity and identity within the legion, within their, their squadron. Uh, ornate plumes, crest holders, and engraved markings were added to the Roman legionnaires' unique helmets. So the direct decorations were not just there to be visually appealing, but they also helped soldiers identify their fellow soldiers and officers during the battle. Do you understand what I just said? The helmet and the, the uh, engravings and decorations were a pull to unity. They helped the soldiers to identify themselves uh, or who was with them in battle. So how important is it for us to recognize other believers in our workplaces and to seek to unify with them. Not that we don't unify with the non-believers, but how, is, how important is it for us to unify with other believers in the marketplace? I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, I think, you know, in scripture where it says we're two or more are gathered and the thing about being in the workplace together is God's given us the same territory, right? If we're in the same workplace, there is something about the territory he's given us to steward that there, there is a shared, um, experience in that territory, but there's also a shared mantle of what the Lord wants to do in you in that space. And so where, when the two of you can come together, you know, there are things that, you know, like Pamela, there are things that you and I are going to share because we're both counselors that my family is not going to understand if I bring it. Right. And so there are places you could stand with me in prayer in the battlefield of my work that my family could pray for me, but they're not going to know how to lean in Specific. and pray. <laughs> right. Because 
you would be much more aware of the things that I'm coming up against in the kind of work that I'm doing. And so I do think there's something very significant. One, always where two or more are gathered, that that we are more powerful together. God designed us for connection and to thrive that way. But I think especially in the workplace, there is value um, when you are when you are marching forward in the same territory together that you can recognize. Cause I, when I was in counselor training, I don't know about you with group therapy, uh, one, the, my professor in group therapy, he said, you know what? The beauty of group therapy is instead of two, one set of eyes, I have 12 sets of eyes that get to see what's going on. Cause he was teaching us how to trust that there's more information in the group because there are more of us and and that there's something very powerful about that in group therapy. Right. And that always stuck with me. (laughs) He was like, I have 12 other sets of eyes. And and it's that same kind of component here. Right. I agree. I agree. Did you want to comment before I go to the breastplate of righteousness? Only to say God called us to be what I've written about OJWs on the job witnesses. And what we bring to the table when we walk together in unison unison, is that we will be known by the fruits that we bear. And we're his disciples in the workplace. And when we let our light so shine, and just imagine a brighter light shining when there's more than one person walking around with the light. And the behavior that we exemplify according to the fruit of the spirit, when we are allowing that to be evident in our model, and when there's more opportunities, there's more territory taken back, as Jessica's t- saying. We, we Listen, we walk in authority. And the first step that we take into the workplace, it becomes holy ground. Oh. Yeah, it becomes holy. Ground. Yes, Beth. Yes. So yes. It's terrible. Yes. And if I'm there and you're there, and I love what Jessica said about you two being able to relate be on the same level and using that as, you know, an analogy, so to speak, that when we walk in and and spirit no spirit. Yes. The world said game knows game but you will know them by the fruit that they bear. And, and, and when that's, when the spirit, you know, Oh my gosh, I just thought about something, Elizabeth and, um, Oh gosh, come Mary. On. Mary, Mary, come on. I was like, Oh gosh, come on, Beth, Mary, the, the connectivity, the baby leaped. Mm-hmm. And when people are around that and experience that happening. Yes. yes. In the marketplace, can you yes. imagine the territory that is taken back? Amen. So we're going to uh, end our session with the breastplate of righteousness. Okay. Uh, and I'm actually going to do two questions together so we can get them in at the same time. A lot of people have uh, the erroneous notion that the breastplate of the Roman soldier only covered the front of his body. But that wasn't so. There were several types of Roman breastplates. Uh, one, uh, one was made of heavy linen covered with thinly sized animal horns or hooves fashioned to the linen. These overlapped for protection but gave the wearer freedom of movement. Another type was of molded metal that went from the base of the neck down to the thighs covering and protecting all the vital organs of the body. No Roman soldier would ever have gone into battle without his breastplate. It protected him not only from the sword and spear in close combat, but also from arrows coming from the side or from the rear. Without it, he would not have, he would have been hard pressed to defend himself. Underneath the breastplate is the heart, lungs, and other organs necessary for life. Therefore, if a soldier did not wear his breastplate, he was vulnerable to an attack that could result in instant death. 
finally, it is not just any old breastplate that we put on. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. Throughout the New Testament, there are three forms of righteousness. The word used here in Ephesians, I won't say what it is, but it's the word, I mean, I can't pronounce the Greek word, but it's the word that, uh, that means justice. It's used for righteousness. So it means judicial approval. You've been approved of God, is what Paul is saying about this breastplate of righteousness. It's a breastplate that says we have been approved of God. We have been deemed right by the Lord after he has examined us. Did you hear what I said? The breastplate that we wear is one that indicates that we have been approved of God after he has examined us. So I have two questions for the two of you. In what way uh, can, or, or rather, in what way do our progress uh, keeps distractors from attacking us, attacking us from the front and the rear? In other words, how does our righteousness keeps us not from just being attacked from the front, but also from the rear? And how does putting God, and I wanted this one to go to you specifically, Beth, so listen to it because this is the one I wanted you to take us out on. Uh, in putting God back in business, what is important about doing what is deemed right by the Lord? So that's the one I want you to take us out on. Uh, but before that, uh, how does putting on righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, keep us from being attacked? Or keep, uh, at least keep it minimized in the marketplace. You know, when I think about the first part you read with the um, with the righteousness piece, you know, righteousness implies partnership. It is it, the implication that I am because like even when you said the approval of God, well, to gain that, I have to be walking with him. I have to be in deep intimacy with him, right? Because it means that I've allowed him to be sanctifying me and knowing me and and so when I think about that, it makes me think of what you read about the Romans, how they they had different kinds of breastplates. And so when we are approved by God, we have the right breastplate for the right time. Like that, that overarching, like that breastplate of righteousness implies I have this approval of God, but in the moment of that actual protection, God knows which kind of breastplate I need, right? Like, do I, I need, need the, the lighter, linen one, or lighter I one? Need the steel. right? Um, because I won't know that in and of myself. God knows more about the circumstance. He knows more about when I need to move. Cause I, I experienced that in spiritual warfare, right? Like there are times when I need to really hunker down and be well protected. And there are other times that I need to be able to be swift and have movement and, um, to have the freedom and the trust, right? Like, but, but even that requires more from the Lord, because if I'm wearing that lighter body armor, guess who's protecting me, <laughs> right? Like if I am a little less protected by the weight of that breastplate, there's another layer of protection in, in, in the Lord, that, that approval of the Lord, that breastplate of righteousness, um, but that when we're in that partnership with him, that, that's just what I was thinking about as you were reading, like that there when we are under that approval of God, that he gives us the measure of protection in that blessed breastplate of righteousness that we need in any given moment. I feel, and I, I feel impressed to just remind people again, because there's this notion out here that Roman soldiers didn't have anything covering their back. And that's, it was not true. Their armor actually covered their back as well, and it's important to remember, like Jessica said, I mean, God's got your back, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's that righteousness. God's got your back, but not without covering for your back because your lungs can be hurt from the back or from the front, and God wants all of it. Well, and I just want to share a scripture because God, 
God speaks about being that. And it's in Isaiah 52, 12, it says, for you shall not go out in haste for you shall not go and fight for the Lord will go before you and the God and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So that implies that there is protection in front of us and behind us. Right. Yeah. I, I, that was just ringing loudly in my spirit to repeat that. So I hope that helps somebody out. I love it. So uh, Beth, will you take us out with this? Because you're the one that is teaching us how to put God back in business. So I want you to tell us uh, what is important about doing what is right by God uh, in order to make sure that our business is you know, you've been talking about put on the brush plate and God immediately, I can't stay out of Colossians for some reason doing this call today. And so I'm back at Colossians in, in three, but he says, but now you ourselves are to put off all of these things and their anger, wrath, malice, bas blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth and do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man. The, the, the urgency and the importance is being identified as a new man, as a new creature in him. That is going to be our passage way to be able to be a witness for him, to draw others to Christ through the behavior, but it goes on to say, um, put off the old man with his deeds and have put on what we're talking about now, the new man who's renewed what we mentioned earlier in Romans 12 in knowledge, according to the image of who created him. The urgency is that we represent him well, that we walk in his image because he created us to be vessels of him, to, to imitate him to others. And it goes on to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, and all of that. And it, But one of the things is bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, you, as Christ forgave me, I'm to forgive them. And so the urgency is what's at stake is to understand our purpose in the workplace covertly and overtly to understand that I do have a purpose beyond my task. I do have a purpose beyond my task. And that's the people person pur purpose. You know, it's all about God's people. And that's where God's people ministry came from 20 some years ago, because I was thinking of, you know, God, I've got the business part. I got this part. And then drum was in business as, um, you know, uh, carpentry and contractor. And I was like, how do I, it's going to be Copeland Enterprises. And God says, like, no, it's not. No, not at all. it's going to be God's people ministry because it wasn't about us and the things that we were doing. It was about God's people. And I just love this discussion is how the urgency, and I know, Pamela, can I just say something? I know somebody somewhere is thinking, it's always about other people. When is it about me? You know, when is it about me? Um, you, everything I, it falls back to, you know, I've got to die to myself. I got to do this. I got to forgive them. I got to do this. Listen, God is well pleased with us. He chose us because he knew what he had placed within us. It's not by happenstance. He knew what it, he it's, had it's placed with definitely on track that God chose you and he chose me. And right. as rulers and as champions, as leaders, we need people that are willing and ready to gird up our loins with strength 
to walk this thing out in the workplace because we're living in a dying world right now. Yes. People need to see Jesus. And God's counting on you. And we believe in you. Yeah. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and you yes. know what I want to say? God has a plan. And, and we you know, are a part of it. A part of it. I, I mean, I feel like, um, you know, uh, Saul said, you know, I'm preaching myself happy. You know, before, <laughs> but, girl, Keen Agrippa, you ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> I'm preaching myself happy. This has been a wonderful discussion today. Thank you, ladies. We miss Christine. She's enrolling, I believe, her last um, daughter. It, she's going to yeah, be she's in orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Orientation today for college. Oh, wow. She and Rich are going to be empty nests, huh? How about that? But we missed her today. But I want to thank you all because you have blessed my heart this day. Thank you from everything, from the behind the scenes prayers, the encouragement, being on this platform. I, my life is enriched by you. And I'm sure others were as well. April and those that uh, were on the Facebook side of the house. I know there were several others at one time that possibly didn't identify themselves. But even if you watch the replay, leave us a note because this is such an awesome platform that is well needed for people to experience the freedom that God intends for us to live in. So thank you for joining us. Visit our website, gcbnetwork.com. We're putting God back in business and we need your help. Also, I want to ask you, men and women, and this is about God golfing girls. If you're a male and you're here in this platform and you have females in your life that are college age and above, I want to challenge you to make that opportunity and space available for them to join us on August 16th through the 18th at our ninth annual God Golfing Girls event. When I tell you it's an amazing weekend that only God could have birthed and we're nine years in and nine is my special number. That's my number. And I'm like, God, this year seems like I just knew it was going to be a lot different than what's happening right now because it's number nine. And God <laughs> said, because it's number nine. Mm -hmm. That's why the attacks are so great. So men, make that space. Provide the funds that are needed. Women, accept the opportunity. And if you don't have a man in your life to do that, I'm asking you to even go out to friends that know that you deserve a weekend away. And God said to me, it's like a mini vacation is what you experience. It is. It's like a it mini is. vacation. He gave that to me this week, Pamela, and you confirmed it just then. It's like it's, a mini it's, it's, vacation. It's a soothing uh, location. Uh, and, and this is my ninth year being there, and it keeps getting as my grandmother would say, gooder and gooder and gooder. <laughs> so. And he gave that to me. He said, it's a mini vacation. And so I want you to experience, if you can't come for the whole weekend, a Friday night is $160. And I mean, it is a night on the town. It's ladies night out. It is just powerful. And it's going to be even more so this year. If you can't come on Friday night, come Sunday, it's 160 and it is going to be amazing. And you get to experience our awesome panel. And then I get to speak on Sunday and Crystal Parker is on Sunday. But on Saturday, if you can join us for one day, I'd almost say come Saturday. That's our white night. Because you get Pamela Bridgman kicking us off, Erica Jackson. All of these awesome speakers that are just, we have a luncheon sponsor, uh, Mon Monifa Robinson, uh, Monifa Grover is our luncheon sponsor. We've got so many opportunities 
for you to participate in. And Taylor Allen is going to facilitate our golf clinic. And if you elect to pay golf, it's only $95. But we want to hear from you. Our sponsorship dollars are low this year. If you're in a position you can't attend, you don't have a woman to send, a female to send, donate to our 501c3, God's People Ministry, sponsor a whole. We need your help this year. And I'm asking you to allow God to move on your heart to sow into this awesome event and God will reward you from your donation. So reach out to us at info at gcbnetwork.com. Reach out to me personally, Beth Copeland, we coping at iCloud.com. We want to hear from you. You can go into a message, I message and say, listen, if you have a desire, let it be known. We're going to work it out. God bless you all. Thank you so much. I love you girls dearly. And we're looking forward to seeing you two at GGG and all of those that God's going to bring. Thanks for joining, guys. Love you guys. Bye-bye now.